This is probably the most important thing, or it's the biggest roadblock that's keeping people from being successful in business. Whether you have a business of your own, or you just want to learn high income skills so that you can use them as a freelance or even to get a high paying job for that matter, what I'm about to show, share with you is what's holding people back from just about everything that they want to do with their lives. Whatever that next level is or that goal that they want to reach in their lives that's going to make their lives better, everybody knows, everybody has those goals, but a lot of people, well, I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people have been beaten down so much that they don't even reach for anything. They just settle for whatever they have. So actually, if you have goals, if you have things that you would like to be better in your life, then you are actually head and shoulders above quite a lot of the population, which is a little bit sad, but that's that's the truth of life. Now, assuming that everybody here actually does have goals and has aspirations, has things that you want in your life that would be better, the truth is that the main block for almost everybody is not just a lack of knowing how to do it. It's a is some psychological barrier that is in the way of letting you do it. Now, I'm going to use business as an example here because that's mostly what I deal with, but this applies to just about everything that you could do, every every goal that you could have. And if you really look into it with with business, I mean there's some things in life that are legitimately difficult to do. Right. Like if you want to be an NBA basketball player, if you want to be a professional athlete, if you want to be a, a Grammy winning musician, like those things are legitimately difficult to do. Being successful in business really is not that difficult. And, and I'm going to explain. However, most people never achieve it. Most people that, that try to or say that they want to be successful in business never get there. So why is that? Well, my belief is that it's because of mental barriers, of psychological barriers, because of mental junk that gets in the way. See, the thing is, you don't have to be a super genius. You don't have to be super talented to be successful in business. It's really a very straightforward set of steps. And maybe you already know what those steps are. Right. Maybe you've bought a course or you bought a coaching program or you have a mentor who has told you, OK, you do this thing and then you do this thing and then you do this thing and then you collect the profit. And for some reason, you just haven't been able to bring yourself to doing those simple steps that the person laid out to you. Why is that? If you think about what is involved. Like what is involved in being successful in business? I heard a great summary of this is that it's like three steps. Number one, you figure out what people want. Step two, you go out and get it. And step three is you sell it to them, right? So you just like ask people what they want and people want a million different things at any given time. Like people have a lot of problems. If you can find one problem that a few people have, you can figure out how to solve that problem and then you can sell them the solution, then you make a lot of money right there. And if you're, if you're watching this, you probably know that I teach you how to solve the problem of marketing, right? The majority of business owners are not getting as many customers as they would like to get. That's a problem. It's a painful problem. They would love to be able to get the amount of customers that would support the lifestyle that they ultimately want to live, but they aren't getting that. So you could learn how to get that for them. You could learn marketing skills. And there's a lot of ways that you can learn that, right? You could learn it from me. You could learn it from there's myriad courses on the internet. There's plenty of coaches. There's plenty of people who show you how to do that, right? You can read books. There's, there's a million ways that you can learn how to do this. And then once you have that skill, you sell it to them, right? You say, hey, I will, I will get customers for you and this is my price per month or this is my price per customer that I bring in through my marketing efforts. So the process is pretty simple, right? And then there's, there's more to it, right? You know, the, there's like, 
okay, so you try, you send out some messages, let's say, let's, let's make this super simple. You send out some messages to some business owners, nobody responds. Well, what do you do? Well, common sense dictates that the business owners are not interested or they don't believe you or, you know, something is making them, even though you know what they desire, or maybe you don't know what they desire, right? Well, something is making them disinterested. So you figure out what that is. It's like, okay, do they not believe me? Do they not actually want the thing that I'm selling? Is it too high risk? Like, what is it? And so you can talk to people and ask them, right? You can go on internet forums and talk to business owners and ask them. You can talk to business owners that you know in real life or, or that you run into in real life or, or in some online group, right? You can figure out what is the problem. If, and if you have a business coach, this makes it a hundred times easier, right? Cause now you can just ask your business coach. Okay. Like, what am I doing wrong here? And then once you have that, you just correct the problem. You try again, you see what happens and then maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, then you go back and do the same process, figure out, okay, what am I missing here? And then you track the results. It's like, okay, I, I sent out a hundred messages and I got only five responses. Like, is that good? Or is that, or, or what you, you look at, okay, so I got five responses out of a hundred messages. That's a 5% response rate. And then of those responses, I got zero people that signed up with me. That's a 0% conversion rate, right? So you like the math here is very simple. You don't have to be a super genius for any of this. And I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of how to do business, but notice that <coughs> everything that I'm explaining here is pretty common sense. If you really lean back and think about it. But we go get so stuck up, like stuck in the moment that, that we don't see these things. And it begs the question, why? Like, why are we not seeing these things? You don't have to be a super genius to do this. It's really, really very common sense. And you, I mean, you may have noticed that some people that are highly successful in business are not super intelligent people. And then on the other hand, a lot of super intelligent people are not very successful financially. I mean, you see them like you'll see in, in life in general, for that matter. And that's, it's very interesting to me that you see people that have the highest IQs and they have a job working as a scientist making 150 grand a year. And it, like, that's it. They work for somebody else. They have never started their own business. They, a lot of times have a hard time with socializing. It's like, if you're so intelligent, why don't you figure it out? Why don't you figure out how to do things? Why don't you figure out how to get the life that you actually want? Because I don't think that what they actually want is to be mediocre and lonely their entire lives. I doubt that. So why are they not using their intelligence to benefit their lives? And the answer to that, again, is the same thing. Mental junk, psychological barriers. Now, there's a lot of different psychological barriers that one could possibly have, but I'm going to get into a few of them, a few of them that I have run into specifically and still do. I'm not saying that I'm cured of all these things, but I'll show you how I've managed to overcome some of them and in part or in full and how it's helped me significantly. So there's one of them is just the the inability to actually follow through. And this is particularly the case if you have a coach or you have a mentor, or you have a step-by-step -step course, like a really good course that you're following, you know that it works, you see people doing it, you see people having success, and yet for some reason you don't follow it. And I see this with my own students often. I see, like I, I hand them on a silver platter. It's like, this is exactly what to do. Just do this and do this and do this. And then they go off in, in the left field and do something completely different. So sometimes it's because they can't focus. It's like, okay, they, they will focus on what I'm telling them for a little bit and the system that I'm showing them for a little bit. 
and then they'll get bored or they'll see some other shiny object and say, okay, well, I'm going to switch over to that. And now they switch over to the shiny object and the shiny object might be a good thing. Like it, it might be really, really useful. It, it could be a great system that it could make them a lot of money or could make them really happy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact that now they have switched their attention means that all of the, the stuff that I've shown them all of a sudden has gone out the window and now they're following something else. <clears throat> and if they were to stick with that other thing, then that might be okay. But the problem is that two weeks later, they're going to find something else over here. They're going to switch their attention again, and they're going to follow this thing. And they're just going to keep switching over and over and over and over again. And they're never going to get anywhere. Right? So part of this is just disciplining yourself to focus, like making yourself say, okay, I heard about this thing. I saw this new ad for this new thing. And it's super cool. Like, I like it. And, you know, maybe I'll even get to it in the future. But for now, I need to stay focused on this thing that I'm already doing until I get to the point where I have brought it to fruition. I've got the results that I initially set out to get. Now, I should caveat that by saying that just because you're already doing something doesn't mean that you should keep doing it forever. Right at a certain point, this is a bit of a balance here. You have to realize, okay, this thing is not working because some things don't work. Some things don't work in general. Some things don't work for you specifically because they don't they don't fit to your particular personality or talents or whatnot. And, and I, I'm I'm almost like I'm regretting saying that as I say it because. This is a this is a big cop out like excuse. It was like, oh no, that's just not my personality. That's it's not like in your situation is what I meant to say more. Like if you have if you wanted if you have a particular business that you want to follow, and or a particular product, and you find a marketing method that works for another product but doesn't work for yours, right? So it may work for somebody else but not work for you. That's that's possible. And then it also something that that happens fairly often is that you follow something that used to work but doesn't work anymore. Although, if you do that, then chances are the thing that used to work just needs a little bit of updating. But you can still use 95% of it and tweak the other 5% for whatever the market is now, and it'll still work. So, um, so that's the caveat, right? It's that you you have to recognize when there there really is something better, and the best way to do that is to know ultimately what you want and why you want it. So the way to figure that out, and, and this is very important if you've never done this before, go through this exercise. Figure out what do you want from life, like everything. And, and don't compartmentalize this. It's not about, I want to make this much money, and so I'm just going to focus on things that make this much money. It's like, okay, well, you want to make this much money. Well, why do you want to make that much money? What does that do for you? And then what, it, because the problem is that if you get too focused on one thing, just like money, then you give up the things that are really important to you to get the thing that is just a tool to get the really important things to you. So let me give you an example of what I mean. So for me, I like money because money buys freedom. If I am bringing in a lot of money, then that means that I, I, can, I don't have to work full time for somebody else. It means that I can pay people to deliver my food, I can pay people to clean my house, I can pay people to do the things that I don't really want to do. So it frees up my time, right? So it gives me time freedom also it gives me location freedom, right? If I can just pay for a hotel or an Airbnb anywhere in the world and pay for flight and, and it doesn't bother me financially like that gives me a degree of freedom. Now, if I was to get a, a job offer, let's say to be an executive at a fortune 500 company, and they'd pay me half a million dollars a year and I would have to work like 65 hours in an office in New York City, let's say, 
Well, I would be, and let's say that's what I wanted. Like I wanted to make half a million dollars a year. That was my financial goal. The problem is if I take that, well, yeah, now I'm getting the goal, but I'm not getting the thing that the goal was for, right? Now I don't have location freedom. I have to go to this office. I have to live in a city that I really don't want to live in. I have to work 65 hours a week doing something I don't really want to do. So it's like, yeah, I got the money, but I lost everything else that I was trying to get with the money. So in order to not fall into this trap, you have to figure out what is everything that you want and why do you want it? So if you say, I want half a million dollars a year, okay, why do you want it? And then it's, and then you, you can go a few layers deeper than this. And this is a really, really good exercise for kind of understanding yourself and your own motivations and what makes you happy. So maybe it's like, I want to buy a nice house or like, I want to buy a house, a house on the ocean. And you ask yourself, okay, why do I want to buy a nice house? Or why do I want to buy a house on the ocean? And, and, you know, maybe the answer is because I like surfing. Or maybe the answer is because I want to impress my parents. You know, whatever it is, be completely honest with yourself about why. And then once you have, if you get through all of that, like you get down to, there's, there's a base reason behind everything that you desire. And then once you get to the base reason, then you'll, and you're, you'll probably find that there are a few base reasons. So let's say that you want the nice house and you also want a nice car. Well, why do you want the nice car? And then maybe the answer is again, to impress my parents. Well, impress your parents is the same thing. It's like, it's the same goal. It's just two different ways to get to the same goal right now. I'm, and don't like judge yourself on any of these things. I'm not, I'm not judging you. I'm not saying, oh, you shouldn't want to impress your parents. I'm, I'm saying like, be completely honest about what your motivations are. And then when you get to the why at the bottom of this, well, you can figure out like everything that you want, everything that you really want, you know, you can, there, there's, I mean, there's probably a thousand things that you want, but like the important things, the ones that occupy your mind the most, get to the bottom of why you want them. And then you can, organize your whatever opportunity that you are seeking, whatever job you're doing, whatever relationship you're seeking, whatever business you want to start, set that up such that you are checking all those boxes of the things that you ultimately want. And so what that helps you do is to realize when you're on the right path. And then you don't have to worry about the shiny object thing. Right, because if you have, let's say you find a path, you find a process that will get you to an end result that gets you everything that you really want. Well, now if you if you see another path to get the same thing, you can you recognize that it's it's no different. Right? It's just another means to get to the same end. And you don't have to like it's not worth the opportunity cost to switch. It's not worth throwing out all the progress that you already that you already made to switch over to this new opportunity. So that's one problem. And, and I highly recommend that you do that exercise, whether you have that problem or not. But that's one problem that people run into is that they can't stay focused on one opportunity. They keep following different things and, and splitting up their intention between a bunch of different things. And by the way, if you're trying to do a whole bunch of like follow a bunch of goals at the same time, you get the same, it's the same problem, right? Let, let's say that you have four hours of free time every day and you can spend all four hours towards one goal, or you can split it up to eight different goals and spend 30 minutes each. Well, you're going to meet the one goal a heck of a lot faster if you're focusing on that completely as opposed to splitting it up between a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So uh, another thing to consider in terms of focus. Now, this goes a little deeper as well, I think, in that people, a lot of times people know exactly what they should be doing in order to get their goal, and yet they don't do it. So, and, and you can notice if you've done this yourself, like I've, I've done it, I'm guilty of this, is that I know exactly what is the next step that I need to meet my goal, 
but I just don't feel like it. I'm like, oh, I'm tired or I, I had a stressful day, so I'm not going to do the thing. I'm just going to sit around and, and watch TV or do something, play video games, or I'm going to do something totally useless, or I'm going to go, go eat a whole pizza by myself and, and basically destroy my energy because I'm putting crap into my body. And it's, it's, this is where it gets difficult to figure out what exactly is going on. It's like, what exactly is it in your mind that is blocking you from doing the thing that you know that you must, the know, that you know would get you to the right, to the place that you want to be. And there's, I think there's, there may be multiple reasons for this, but one of the big ones is that, well, there's a couple, there's a couple big ones. There's, there's two that I'm going to go over that I can think of off the top of my head. Number one is that you don't believe that you deserve it. This is something that gets into some, a little bit esoteric spiritual territory. But if you, if you believe in karma, and I believe in karma, but in a little bit different way than, than some do, to me, the, the punishment that comes from the universe, let's say, that we, that people talk about usually comes from us. It's just a manifestation of guilt. It's, I'm going to get into this painful situation or I'm going to prevent myself from getting the thing that I desire because ultimately I feel guilty because I've done something against my own values or I don't really believe that I deserve it. And this is something that I think probably most of us are carrying around and for a lot of us, it's unconscious. We have this feeling of being unworthy and we're not entirely sure why. So, and it may, it may be something that we don't even consciously remember, right? Like we, we wronged somebody in some way and now we're, that we're holding this, this energy of punishment over ourselves that cause that in the best case scenario keeps us from doing the things we need to do to have a better life. And the worst case scenario, I believe, drives people to actually destroy themselves. I always, it always fascinated me that there were people in the world that would smoke crack or meth or shoot up heroin or nowadays are doing fentanyl. Or there's this documentary I saw about, about these people in Philadelphia. They're taking like, animal tranquilizers and they're like there's they live on the streets there's this like square of a hundred people they're all tranquilizer addicts that like their limbs are rotting off like literally their limbs are decaying they have big open wounds they they're, like they were interviewing one guy he has this big open wound on his leg that's that's wrapped up in bandages and he said it's been an entire year and it has never healed and yet this guy is, is still doing the stupid drug. And I would imagine that most, most of these people must have known, like, how did they get the drug in the first place? They must have gotten it from a friend who was already doing the drug and had already showed how utterly miserable it makes them. Why do people do these things? There are still people that do fentanyl and crack and meth and all of these things. They know it's going to make them absolutely miserable. It's no, it's going to destroy their health. It's going to destroy their minds. It's going to put them out on the street. And yet people still do it. Like, why? Why do people do this? And the only, the only real answer that I can come up with is self-punishment. That they believe that they, that they have to harm themselves 
in order to expiate for some wrong that they have done or, or to expiate even for some feeling of guilt that they have that they may not even know where it comes from. And then, and there's, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they say that in order to, I, I don't know exactly what they say, but the, the gist of it is that in order to finally get better, to, to get out of, recover from alcoholism, they have to first hit rock bottom. So to me, that means it's almost like there's some trigger in the mind that's like, at a certain point, they've humiliated in themselves and, and destroyed their life to such an extent that finally they get to a point where they said, okay, that's enough. I've paid my debt for whatever wrongdoing I've done. Now I can finally start to live a normal life. That's what it seems like to me. I could be wrong about that. That's just my opinion. But I think that what the crackheads and the alcoholics are doing to themselves is not all that different to what the rest of us are doing to ourselves as well. It's just more extreme, right? Where the, the crackheads are, are punishing themselves in the worst possible way. Normal people are punishing themselves in a, a more mild way, right? Like they're, they're spending an hour scrolling through Facebook, being angry, because Facebook, like the Facebook employees have publicly admitted that they tune their algorithms such as to inspire negative emotions in the people that are using Facebook. We know this. And you don't have to know that from the Facebook employees. You can recognize that with your own self. Like you spend half an hour on Facebook. Are you happier than when you started? Probably not. And so, but you keep doing it. It's like, why? Why would you keep doing that? And so my, my, and it's the same as if you know what you need to be doing in order to have a better life, such as, I mean, get off of Facebook, get off of alcohol, do that thing that your business coach told you to do that you know would work if you actually did it, but you don't do it. And so you can ask yourself the question like, okay, is like, why am I, why am I doing this thing that I know is destructive or why am I not doing this thing that I know would make my life significantly better? And if you will answer this question in a state of mental openness, and I know I, I talk about this all the time, but if you don't have a daily meditation practice, I highly recommend it because it's, it helps you to understand your own mind so much better. But you, you, op you calm your mind, you calm your thoughts, and just ask yourself the question, or ask God, ask the universe, ask your guardian angel. I, you know, I don't know what the mechanism is. I don't know who answers exactly. But if you ask the question and silence your mind and listen for the still, small voice, like it says in the Bible, the still, small voice, you ask the question, what, why, why am I, what is it that's causing me to do this to myself? Or what is it that's holding me back from doing the things that I know that I need to do? Is there something in my past that I feel guilty about that I feel the need to expiate? And then if you get that answer, I think you will, something will come up in your mind and then you can go about doing whatever you feel that you need to do in order to right that wrong. So, and that, that's very subjective. It may be that you just recognize that you did wrong to somebody and maybe you never have the opportunity to see that person again. So maybe you, you can't even apologize, but what you can do is you can apologize to God, recognize that behavior, and make the commitment to not treat anybody else like that again. That would be something. Maybe you could help somebody else that you can find who is a victim of something like that in the past. Maybe you can help some, someone else that's completely unrelated. Maybe you go help a homeless person. 
you know, whatever it is that that is in your mind that you need to do that would that would absolve you for yourself. Because again, like you are the judge, you are the one that is judging yourself. You are the one who is punishing yourself. So what would satisfy the judge that you have changed, you have improved, you are no longer that same person that did that thing and that, and now you can feel, you can move on with your life, right? That wrong, the, the debt has been paid. What can you do to make the debt, to pay the debt in your own mind, in your own subconscious? And again, if you don't know, then quiet your mind and ask. And then whatever, whatever comes back, do that thing. My belief is that there's no punishment necessary. For, I mean, if you think about, if you think about, if you're a parent and you punish your child, what is the purpose of punishing your child? It's not to make the child suffer. It's not because the child deserves pain, right? No, it's to correct the behavior. It's so that they they recognize that that sort of thing is not acceptable and they stop doing it. Right. So if you think about yourself in the same way, and this gets into religion, I mean, this idea that that the modern Christianity teaches that that God punishes people for all of eternity. And I think that's a, a gross misinterpretation of the Bible. I don't think Christianity teaches that at all but the modern churches do. If you think about that in terms of, of a parent, like in, in the Bible says, the Bible even compares God to the, well, he calls God the father all the time. And it says that if, you know, if God gives you good, if, if you, even though you are evil, if you know how to good, give, give good gifts to your children, how much more does God know how to give good gifts to his children? And so if, if you, as a parent, if you if your child makes a mistake, would you sit there and just spank your child forever and ever and ever to torture them forever and for their sin? Like, probably not, <laughs> right? We, the, the point of a punishment is to get the person to change their ways. And so after the, if, if the, there is pain that is necessary to get you to change your ways, then that pain will will be inflicted on you, right? But as soon as you do change your ways, then it, it can stop. As soon as you recognize, okay, this thing that I did was wrong, I'm not gonna do it anymore. All of a sudden, the guilt, the pain, the punishment, there's no use for it anymore. It's done. It's It solved its purpose, and so now you can go on. Now you can, how you can not be punished anymore <laughs> for lack of a, of a better wording. So that's one thing is if you feel unworthy in some way or you feel guilty in some way. And then the next thing, and this is another one that's really big is, is you don't truly believe that you can have the thing that you desire or you subconsciously you have accepted that the situation that you're in, however painful, is the only one that is available. And so the way that you get out of this one is to change your beliefs. Now, changing your beliefs, this is another thing where I think that modern religion really lets us down because religion says that, or Christianity says that we're saved by faith. And it's, it really emphasizes the importance of faith, but for some reason, neglects to ever tell us how. It's like, okay, well, how am I going to believe something that I don't already believe? And so I'm going to tell you what's, at least what's worked for me. The way that you believe something, if you want to believe something, but you don't entirely believe it, is repetition of observation. So... To use, I, I don't mean to make this into a sermon, but to use another reference from the Bible, when the when Jesus walked on the water, 
out to the boat where the disciples were. And then Peter noticed, it said that, oh, I want to walk on the water too. And so he stepped out of the boat and he started walking on the water towards Jesus. And it's, to me, that's a very interesting story because Peter was able to do that, which is a, obviously a very unusual thing to do because he already saw someone else do it first. If you observe something happening, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to believe that it can happen, right? If you watched somebody walking on the water, you'd be much more likely to believe that walking on the water is possible. Similarly, if you watch somebody being successful in business, then you're much more likely to believe that being successful in business is possible. And then that compounds for how many times you observe the same thing. So if you watch a thousand people all be successful in business, and in fact, if you have a social circle of 100% people who are successful in business, then it becomes normal. And it's not difficult to believe at all. It just seeps into your brain and becomes totally normal and you believe it 100%, you have complete conviction. Now, the same is true in the opposite way, right? If you hang out with a bunch of alcoholics and drug addicts and, and people that like never do anything with their lives and they're always broke and they're always miserable, well, then you're going to get those repeated observations of everybody is broke and miserable. And so that's going to be what what filters into your belief system is that what's normal and what's the, the normal way of being is being broke and miserable. So you can control your environment to a certain extent. You can control who you hang around. And I mean, that's part of it. That's the most difficult part because let's say that you want to be a millionaire. And so you're going to, you're like, okay, well, I only want to hang around with millionaires. Well, you have to, you know, find those millionaires and then convince them to hang around with you, which is a little easier said than done. You can, it's doable. You can absolutely do that if you want to. But what you could do that's easier is you could watch YouTube videos from millionaires. You could read books by millionaires. You could watch TV shows of millionaires doing their thing, like those, like, cribs and that kind of thing. You got to, although there is a, a caveat to that in that society is very big on pushing this idea of just getting lucky or you got, or you, you're born, either you're born lucky or you, you won the lottery, right? Like the lottery is the perfect example of this. It's like a million people sign up for their chance to get a bunch of money and only one person out of all those gets picked. They're the lucky, lucky winner and they get picked and then they get all the money. The same thing is true basically with, with things like American Idol. You got like millions of people auditioning to be American Idol and then one of them every year gets lucky and actually gets picked. Or, or Hollywood is kind of the same thing. It's like you got a million people that are auditioning for these roles and then one of them gets picked. And so it's it's kind of reinforces this idea of, of your, it's just a matter of luck. It's just like you were at the right place at the right time. And the person, the, the high up elite person decided to say, you're the one, I pick you. And I think, I, I think this is intentional. I think it's part of the reason that a lot of our celebrities are so untalented and so utterly unremarkable is that this is intentional. Like they want you to believe that. And again, this, this is building belief. The people that, that control the propaganda machines of society, they know how to build beliefs in people. And I'm showing you the same way. It's just, I'm, I'm showing you how to do it to help your life. Whereas they're doing it for other reasons. But they know how to build beliefs in you. And if they can show you repeated observations of, oh, this person is a star because they got lucky. There's nothing remarkable about them. They're not that talented. They're not like there's there's nothing they had. They didn't work that hard. They just 
were one of a million contestants on American Idol and they got picked, or they just happened to, to be born into the right family. And they, they really try to push this with economics too. Like they try to push this idea of if you see a rich person, it's because either they got lucky, like they won the lottery or they got lucky by getting an inheritance. So they're building that belief that it's only by luck. So what you want to do is the opposite. You want to be around people or exposed to people observing examples of people who got rich or got the things that they wanted in life, got the things that you want in life more specifically by their own effort, by following, a, a, following steps that you could also follow, right? And you got to figure out what those are. I mean, if you're looking at pro basketball players that happen to be six foot 10 and you're not six foot 10, well, that's, I mean, that's not exactly applicable, but if you can find people that are relatively unremarkable, but were able to be successful through their own efforts. And when I say unremarkable, I mean, from a from a situation of birth. It's not like, you know, you look at Elon Musk and it's like, okay, well, yeah, that guy is a super genius. I'm not a super genius, so so that doesn't apply to me. Or LeBron James is, is super tall and has great genetics and I don't have the same genetics. But if you look at people that, that were not born rich, they were not born six foot 10, they're not born with an IQ of 150, right? They're just kind of normal people and if you can look at those examples, and there are a lot of them, there are a lot of them. You can read a lot of books and you can watch a lot of videos. You can take a lot of courses from people like this. And the more you expose yourself to that, the more normal it becomes. And the more you build the belief in your own mind that it's possible. And not only is it possible, but it's, it's likely. So that's, that's step one is just to expose yourself to the examples, expose yourself in a way that makes it normal and makes it believable that you can achieve the same thing, right? Because if you don't believe that you can have the things that you want, well, how hard are you going to work for something you don't believe you can get? Probably not very much. And then the you got to think about the inverse as well. It's like avoid negative programming. Avoid the television programming. They tell you right in the in the name, it's television programming. So if you're going to program your mind, well, have some intentionality about that. Don't just let whatever comes on. And social media is awful about this, by the way, right? The, you scroll through the algorithm and the algorithm determines what you're going to see. And so you're you're leaving your mental programming up to the whims of some... AI algorithm that is in many cases actually programmed to make you unhappy. <laughs> so that's, that's how to build belief. And then the other piece to that is desire, right? So, so uh, let's break this down into kind of, I'm, I'm spitballing here. And, and the reason that I'm doing these, these lives, by the way, is, because it gives me practice with speaking off the cuff and creating ideas and, or not even creating ideas, but, but letting the ideas flow and, and getting used to presenting without uh, unscripted, essentially unscripted. It's, it's a skill to be able to present unscripted. And that is a skill that I'm, I'm looking to build. And that's why I do these. So to put a little bit more structure on this step one, is to notice if there's any mental blocks that are related to guilt or feelings of unworthiness and clear those. Step two is the belief that you can actually have the thing that you desire, right? Create that belief in yourself. The way that you create the belief is through repeated exposures to examples or observations of that thing occurring. And by the way, there's another, another trick that you can use with that that works really, really well. And that is just to visualize some of the, well, a lot of the most, most successful people in the world will talk about how they visualize constantly. 
they visualize success. Now, most of us visualize naturally. And so let's say that there's something that you want or there's something that's coming up. Let's say, let's say a test. Let's say you're in school and you're about to take a test and it's an important test. And if you pass the test, then something great happens. And if you fail the test, then something bad happens. Well, you can, chances are, you're gonna visualize before you actually take the test, you're imagining what happens on the test. You're either imagining what happens if you pass the test and this great thing happens, or you're imagining if you fail the test and this terrible thing happens. Well, whatever you imagine is an observation in your mind. Just like if you're observing somebody else's life, just like if you're observing a book you're reading, if you're observing TV or a video or a course that you're taking, every, every visualization is an observation. So when you're observing something good happening, you are actually building, you're strengthening the belief that that, that good thing can happen. When you observe the bad thing happening, you are building that belief that the bad thing can happen. So it's really, really important that you learn to discipline your mind and, and visualize the good things. Now, it's not bad. It's not like the end of the world if you visualize something bad happening because it can alert you to, you know, if you, if you are like walking outside in the forest and you visualize what if a snake comes out and bites you it's like okay well that's that's helpful because it's kind of a warning it's like okay now you can do whatever is necessary to avoid the snakes but the problem is when you're visualizing that over and over and over and over again and especially when you're visualizing something that you don't actually have a control over because the more that you repeat that belief in your head the more you actually attract it to you and the more you create the belief, and especially when it's a matter of I'm going to do this thing and it's either going to work or it's not going to work. If you visualize it not working, like if you do, if you visualize, you do all this work to build this business and then, and then nobody buys your thing. And you think about that and you think about how terrible it'll be like that will completely sap your energy and that will, that will destroy your belief or that will create a negative belief. Whereas if you visualize yourself succeeding, the more you repeat that, the more that builds the belief that you're gonna succeed and that more that, that powers you, it gives you motivation to actually do it. So that's the second thing is building belief. Now, the third thing is desire. If you, let's say that Let's say, I'm trying to think of a silly example here. Let's say that you could, that you, you fully believe that you could, like, I'm, I'm in, a, in a house by the beach right now. Let's say that I, I believe that I could run down to the beach and lay in the sand and bury myself in the sand. I totally believe that I could do that. And I don't have any guilt complexes that are keeping me from doing that. Am I gonna do it? Well, the answer is no, I'm not gonna do it because I don't want to, right? So the that's the third part of the equation. Uh, that was a silly example, I know, but the the desire for the thing has to has to overcome the perceived amount of work that is going to go into creating the thing or to making the thing happen. So if you want something a little bit, but you know it's going to take a lot of work for you to get it, then you're probably not going to do the thing. So let's say, I mean, let's say I wanted to be a lawyer and it's like, okay, yeah, being a lawyer, like they make pretty good money, but I have to go to law school for six years and I have to learn about law, which I hate. I don't like that at all. The, the desire is just not strong enough for me to actually go and do it. So 
whatever it is, you have to have that desire. Now, if you go back to that exercise that I talked about at the beginning of getting, of like listing everything that you want and then figuring out, getting to the bottom of why you want it, well, that's helpful. That will help you. The more you get clear on what you actually want, the higher your desire is going to be. And then what's also helpful is, again, visualization. But now you're visualizing the the thing that you ultimately want. So let's say you want a really nice car. Let's say you want a, a Ferrari and you visualize yourself walking to the Ferrari, admiring how beautiful it looks, opening the door, sitting in the seat, powering it up, listening to the sound of the engine. Think about how excited that makes you feel. And then, and then like, driving on the highway and ex accelerating from zero to 60 in five seconds or whatever it is. And like how that feels in your body and how, like how exhilarating that is. The more emotion that you can get into that, the more, the more that's going to increase the desire of whatever it is that you are, that you are interested in. So if you, and it could be, I mean, you really want the thing like, but the amount of desire that you can have for the thing that you already want, you can modulate that. You can actually modulate it a lot. So let's say, and let me give you a counterexample to that. So you're thinking about how amazing it's going to be to drive this Ferrari and how good it feels. But now visualize what happens the first time the Ferrari breaks down. Now you have to like, you have to leave it on the side of the road and now you gotta gotta like call the ferrari dealership and you gotta see how much like i i'm sure i don't know how much it costs to fix a ferrari or how, how long you have to wait but it's probably a pain and so if you think about like how much that's gonna suck and then think about like parking your ferrari at the grocery store and now you have to worry about people are gonna like bang their car door into it or some angry leftist is going to say, oh, that person's rich. I'm mad at that person and like kick your car or scratch it with their keys or something like it. And you have to worry about it getting stolen. And, and like there's there's every everything that's good, everything that you want, there's always going to be downsides. No matter how good the thing is, there are always downsides. So if you visualize everything that I just told you, then you're going to be you're going to be a lot less like your desire is going to diminish as opposed to if you if you visualize the positive aspects of it. And so you can you can modulate your own desire that way. A lot of people do this somewhat unconsciously because they don't believe that they can have the thing. So they say, oh, well, yeah, having a Ferrari, that would be a nightmare. I don't want that. It's, you know, it's too much cost if it breaks. You have to worry about it getting stolen, yada, yada, yada. And they're, they're doing that as a coping mechanism because they actually do want the thing, but it's so uncomfortable to really want something at the same time not believe that you can have it. So the trick is to increase the desire and increase the belief in it. And, and there's a... Some people would say that you don't want to increase the desire too much because it, it's unbalanced. And so, like, I'm not quite sure what to think about that, but it's th there is definitely a balance there. Like, if you if you want something so bad, it hurts and it's just it pisses you off that you don't have that thing, then that's probably not the best energy to come from. The kind of the sweet spot is like wow, this thing is going to be so nice and I'm, I'm going to be so happy when I have that. And notice the wording I used there. I'm going to be so happy when I have that. So you have the belief and you have the desire, but the desire is not so overwhelming that you're like going crazy because you're not there yet. It's, it's, it's like enjoyable. The visualization should make you happy. If it's, you're literally happy when you're thinking about this thing, then you're doing it right. Otherwise, you either need to do a better job of building the belief or you need to tone it down a little bit. But it should be a positive like desire and it should make you happy. So 
I think I'll leave it there, but there was like, those are the, the three things that if you will address, will give you the, the drive that you need to do just about anything that you want to do. Assuming that you already know what it is that you need to do. And if you don't already know what you need to do, you could probably figure it out pretty quick. Right. And, and that's another thing you can do if like if you really don't have the information, that same meditative exercise where you just clear your mind and say and just ask, OK, what's the first step? And a lot of times it's something pretty obvious. It's like, oh, yeah, I have an uncle that can do this or I have this guy that's sending me emails that knows how to do this. I'll ask him or I, I can just type into Google how to do X, Y, Z. Then that's a start, you know not saying that that's necessarily going to be the best way that that's ultimately going to get you to the point. But if you, if you do something like if you take some first step to figure out, because now we have just like basically unlimited information. So if you want to know how to do something, how to get some goal, well, there's somebody out there that's sharing on the internet, how to do it. I almost guarantee it. So, um, so, Clear the mental blocks in terms of guilt, of, of unworthiness, and then create the belief that you can have the thing that you want. Get clear on the thing that you do want. Maybe I should have made that point number one. So get clear on the thing that you do want. Two, clear out the, the guilt and the unworthiness. Three, create the belief through repetition of observation. And then four is create the desire so that it's it's at the point where it's motivating to you. So I hope that was helpful. And oh, Edward says, and the stress of being broke and not having the income I want clouds my thinking. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, if you, it, that's, it, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle, right? Like you, you are in a difficult situation. The situation stresses you out because the situation stressing you out, it clouds your thinking. It makes you unable to fix the situation. The situation gets worse. You get, it gets more stressful. And then that blocks your thinking all the more. And so it's just this, like it, it's never ending. And so the way that you break that is by controlling the mental aspect of that, right? Because the mental aspect is something you have control over now. Your situation might take you a little bit of time to get out of. So if you're in a situation that you're, you're broke, well, you're not going to be able to get unbroke overnight. You're not going to be able to snap your fingers and you're unbroke. What you can do though, is stop thinking about it. Stop stressing out about it. Think about instead the things that you want. And then, and even if you if you can't reach that thought, by the way, because if you're in a very negative headspace, it's hard to go. It's hard to go totally negative to totally positive, right? You have to kind of go through gradations. And I highly recommend Abraham Hicks, by the way. There's a book called "Ask and It Is Given" by Abraham Hicks. That's, that's very helpful for this. And it's. And one of the things that you can do, like if you're in a very negative headspace, is just clear your mind, just meditate, think about nothing, focus on your breath, focus on the, the hum of the air conditioner or something inconsequential. And so going from negative to nothing is sometimes a lot easier than going from negative to positive. It's a, it's a smaller jump. And then from, from nothing to positive is easier. And then you can also notice like what, when you're in a certain mood, if you're feeling negative, what kind of thing makes you feel better? And it could be, you know, it could be just a little bit better. It could be li listening to negative music makes you feel better. For me, that's, that's kind of the case for me. Or listening to, it, it, like there's, there's things that'll make you feel a little bit better. There's things that make you feel about the same. There are things that'll make you feel a little bit worse. And so find the ones that make you feel a little bit better. And then that puts you at a higher level of a higher emotional state. And then from there, you can find something that makes you feel a little bit better still. And so basically the, the higher your emotional state, the happier you are, the better your mind works. 
So if you're in this, stuck in this state of stressing out and worrying, then your mind is not going to work very well. But if you can gradually step yourself up to that higher state, then all of a sudden your, your brain works better and better and better. And then when you're in a place where you have that desire, you have that belief, you have that motivation, that's when you can really hit the ground running and do the things that are going to, that are going to eventually change your situation for the better. And thank you for going over all this. I'm overwhelmed and stressed out all the time. I'm trying to start my online business and trying to manage my offline business. Family owned and operated funeral home. And I'm just jumping from one thing to the next. Yeah, so I, I hope that this is helpful for giving you some focus. And, and yeah, if you get into that negative thinking state, like you're, in my experience, you almost never do anything productive from a state of thinking negatively. So the first, like the first priority, at least for me, when I'm in a, when I'm stuck in a, a negative thought loop is to break out of that. And, and so sometimes that means meditating, exercise is good for that. Like if you go to the gym, go, go for a run, nature is good for that. Like go for a walk outside. That's really, really helpful, at least for me. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's helpful. And yeah, so thanks for, thanks for listening. And I will talk to you all next week. Bye everybody.